internet. Welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And even though it's a little bit dark, we don't got the lighting right. Oh, it's hot. <laughs> uh, we are coming at you with the interim edition as we settle into Oaks, uh, North Dakota here. Things are going pretty good overall. Uh, but kind of learning the new way about a place is a little bit challenging as you try to live out of boxes and figure out where to shop and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, we're getting there. It's coming along, but it's still going to be a little while before I have the time to learn how to use the camera that Peter always kind of took care of before and yeah so we, we got a little learning curve ahead of us but even so trying to come at you with an NASA pastor for this Friday and we got a pretty decent question I am no, by no means an expert on this particular answer but I'm going to be relying on uh, an expert and then hopefully pointing you to some issues etc as well to follow up with it so uh, here's the question oh Dick, dude, there we go uh, Pastor Fisk I am a lifelong confessional Lutheran accustomed to lots of liturgy. Yeah, rock on, good for you, especially if you learned why we do it, because it is just so solid when we know what's going on and it's not just kind of repeating things blindly. Well, anyway, recently my Greek Orthodox friend invited me to their Pascha service and I was impressed. Yes, the liturgy of the Orthodox can be very impressive, especially as we have this whole worship war stuff going on in the LCMS. I was impressed both with their liturgy and with their teachings. Hmm, really? Interesting. However, I noticed a few key differences, like praying to Mary, kissing pictures of Jesus. Uh, what are the key differences between Greek Orthodoxy and Lutheranism to understand as I talk to my friend about our face? Thanks for all you do, Emily. Yeah, uh, the, you know, the kissing the picture isn't necessarily wrong, although that is connected to some of their uh, icon theology. And uh, depending on which Greek Orthodox person you talk to, uh, you know, it really does come down to being a kind of idol worship where you're, you're gaining things by this action with this picture and whatnot. Clearly, the praying to marry thing is a little bit odd, but one of the first things to know about the Greek Orthodox is it's a bit like trying to herd cats. Uh, you know, you talk to one, they say this. You talk to another, they say this. You know, tradition, 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 but it's all different traditions, and they don't really have confessions the way that we do, and what they'll end up eventually doing is pointing you back to their liturgy as what they really believe, which, for the most part, is okay, but then again, not entirely so. So, again, I am not the expert, but I'm going to be relying on a classic work. Can you read it there? F. A. Myers, Religious Bodies in America, an LCMS work from the 50s. I believe, and you know, sure, it could be updated. There's no doubt about that, but really, uh, who's going to do it? And it ain't going to be me. I'm not that solid. Uh, we just don't make guys like this anymore, it seems to me. I, no, that's not fair. There's a lot of good guys out there, but they're busy trying to stay alive. This was back when we were like, we were a system. Anyway, now I'm just living in the glory days. Bronze! Anyway, so here, here's the deal, right? Um, Orthodox theology, and I'm going to be reading here and then interpreting a little bit to you. Orthodox theology maintains that the source of religion, the formal principle of its theology, is the Holy Scriptures and the sacred tradition. And it says, thereby it is taking a mediating position between Rome, which adds pious opinions and papal decrees to the holy traditions, and those Christians who reject, reject Christian complete, uh, tradition completely. So, theoretically, what the Orthodox say is we have the Holy Scriptures, and we have Orthodox tradition, and the Scriptures are the highest level of all of this, so we certainly are under that, but we also have tradition, and tradition reveals spiritual truth to us. Um, that's their formal, official statement about what they're all about. Now, it's a little bit different than that. Uh, we'll get to their material principle in a moment, but... They do accept the books of the Old Testament, but in the Septuagintal version, the Greek version, including its Apocrypha and whatnot, uh, which Protestant Christians would have an interesting time trying to figure all of that out. Uh, in the widest sense, uh, traditions, though, then include the teachings of Jesus and the apostles that were handed down generation to generation uh, and collected in the scriptures and then other documents of the past, including the writings of the church fathers. And so for uh, you guys got to know this at the start, what are the key differences? They don't consider the final formal truth to be scripture alone, right? They do mediate between us and Rome, but really it's you know, once you let the foot in the door, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, tradition has become a source of doctrine for them. So in the final analysis, uh, the Holy Orthodox Church uh, is the source of all matters of faith. It is the church itself that becomes the giver of truth. Uh, the undivided church, of course, prior to the schism between East and Rome uh, around the year 1000 and, and so forth. Um, 
in the past, at least at the time that uh, Meyer is writing, the laity are discouraged from reading the scriptures because they are not considered capable of penetrating into the profound spiritual truths found there. Now, American Orthodoxy might have changed a little bit on that. And there, of course, are bodies within Orthodoxy, almost denominations. So again, you can't herd the cats quite that easily. Um, but it's something that's out there. Uh, but instead, they kind of point you to the ancient creeds, uh, the decrees of the ecumenical councils, uh, the decrees of the councils subsequent to the separation of East and West, the Orthodox Confession, since that of St. Peter of Magilla, uh, encyclicals of the Patriarch of Constantinople, and the authorized catechisms of the Eastern Church. Now, nothing wrong with having a catechism, but it's not a source of doctrine, but see, for them it kind of is. And that's, that's that's the challenge, and of course you're going to find the Orthodox person says, no, 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 Scripture's it, Scripture's it, Scripture's it, but then in practice it just doesn't always work out that way. Now, let's get to their material principle, though, right? So, so formal principle is Scripture and tradition. Material Material principle, the, the thing that really gets their theology or spirituality going, the central idea can be summarized in the words of St. Athanasius, someone who we respect in many ways, although I think we disagree with him on, on this one, that, that Christ, well, at least in the way that the Orthodox understand this, that Christ became man, that man might become divine. So in accord with this, Eastern Orthodoxy uh, follows the teachers of the 2nd and 3rd centuries who view Christ's work largely as theopoiesis, or, or sometimes called theosis, the, the, the God-making of man, the deification of man, bringing man to a full participation in God's godhood. Yeah, Not a restoration of man to his perfect manhood through participation with the person of the of the Son of God who is God, but a, a little further in than that, as as it were. Um, this is based, from our point of view, on a Neoplatonic view of man's final destiny. You know, Plato and Neoplatonism had this sort of like ideal versus real thing where this material world ultimately has got to pass away. It's just not, not good enough. you got to be pure idea. And uh, that's kind of at root here that somehow man really is going to leave behind his manhood, that manhood isn't perfect enough. Yeah, kind of thing. Um, the Eastern Orthodox Christian then seeks eternal life in the permanent rooting in the ultimate reality that is God. Uh, they hold that in Christ a new divine principle has been implanted into human nature itself and through the church is being imparted to all who are in Christ's mystical body. And what this means is that man is therefore viewed as being incomplete rather than sinful. Right? And so Christianity is the completion of man through this moving toward God participation rather than the justification of man from his broken state. Yeah, not that they would deny sin. It's it's. I don't want to say we're splitting hairs, but it's it's a fine idea here that we're working with. So salvation then is presented as a vitalistic matter, a, a new life in Christ. That's what really matters is the new life in Christ, not justification by grace through faith, but this, this new life that you're going to live, not deliverance from the penalties of sin, but this, this regenerative thing that you're going to experience, right? And so it is very closely related to Methodism and there's, and pietism, frankly, and there's, there's no uh, kind of surprise there when you find out that both John Wesley, as well as other pietist Lutheran bodies have had some very friendly conversations with Eastern Orthodoxy. Well, duh, they kind of have the same, we would say, false salvific anthropology. Yeah. Um, so, in Meyer's words, the material principle of Eastern theology is that man is saved not from sin, but for service to God. Huh? See the twist there? And it's all about emphasis, right? Uh, is your emphasis on the wrong syllable or not? It's not that we're not going to serve God. It's not that God has not made us participators uh, in the the mystery of, of the uh, the body of Christ, who is God. Um, but what what is the essence of this? What's it really all about? Whereas for Lutherans, we're going to say justification by grace through faith. They're going to say uh, becoming participants with God through service to him um, uh, so we're saved not from finitude which leads to sin but for the infinity of God uh, who keeps man from sinning so in brief salvation is the ennobling purification and rebirth of man and that is the material principle reflected in all of their theology including then even the kissing of icons and the praying to Mary um, now 
There are some uh, uh, theological uh, differences and similarities. You know, their doctrine of God uh, is oriented much more in philosophical thought than the patterns of Western theology. Uh, that's one piece. Their doctrine of man, you have the elements of Neoplatonic philosophy that are there, uh, that man is incomplete as he was created uh, in the person and the work of Jesus. Uh, in describing the theanthropic person of Christ, the Eastern Church has used the term terminology was the church has employed in the various Christological controversies. That's actually a good thing. Um, the Eastern Church is in agreement with the dogmatic formulations of Chalcedon. So their, their Christology in that sense uh, is quite right. But then when you get to the work of Christ, that Neoplatonic principle manifests itself again uh, in the view that sincere acceptance of Christ's doctrine becomes the seed of immortality. You almost, you can hear Finney right, right in the middle of that thing, uh, if you know what I'm saying. Salvation by grace. They'll actually talk about this, just like a Roman Catholic will. But grace has become uh, uh, redefined for them. It's used to denote God's essential goodness, which prompts him to give all, uh, give man all that he needs to reinstate him to his righteous state. But it may also denote the divine power by which man appropriates the redemptive work of Christ. Sounds a little Roman Catholic there. So this grace or divine saving energy is given to the church distributed through the sacrament so that you may cultivate the life in Christ and prepare yourself for eternity. Very much on par with the, the latter of Roman Catholicism, which leads them into the whole purgatory stuff because, you know, if you don't get enough grace to get enough good, then you can't get out, and so you got to finish it up after you're dead. So you got that going on. Um, Doctrine of the Church is actually a really uh, significant issue. Uh, since the Reformation, the Eastern dogmaticians have formulated their doctrine of the Church. The Reformation kind of forced this to happen uh, in a lot of places, but it's in sharp antithesis. This is against Rome and especially Lutheranism, stating expressly that the Lutheran definition of the Church as the communion of saints, right, the people gathered around the word and sacraments of Jesus, reduces the Church to a Platonic idea. So they're accusing us of being the Platonists who don't have a real church we just have an idea church although i don't know when i'm in there on sunday it's pretty real but you know whatever um they say that the church is both visible and invisible so what, what they're getting at there is you got to have an organization that has power basically that that's what church is not just the assembly of christians around word and sacrament but this official authority power structure uh must exist um they base this on the incarnation because Jesus was was visible. Um, uh, she ministers uh, the grace of God under visible signs. We don't disagree with that it, 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 all the way. Obviously, the signs of word and sacrament are there. Um, <laughs> uh, they were they may remain committed to the creeds and the councils far more than we would. We love the creeds. We love the early church. We love what they say, but we do still test it against scripture. They'll put a lot more weight on that. Uh, there's more here on the sacraments. You can go and get this book. It's available on Kindle and read up on it yourself if you're if you're hungry for more. Some here on uh, eschatology, and then there's of course the uh, those bodies that are here in America and they don't all agree. I mentioned sort of the denominations of Eastern Orthodoxy. You have the Albanian Orthodox the Bulgarian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, the Romanian Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Serbian Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox, Syrian Antiochian Orthodox, the Ukrainian Orthodox, and the American Holy Orthodox Catholic Apostolic Eastern Church, Apostolic Episcopal Church, Holy Orthodox Church of America. And those are all separate bodies who sort of talk to each other on different levels and, uh, yeah, herding cats. So if you're Orthodox and you think I'm totally wrong, I might be, um, but I'm not so sure you're exactly totally right. Yeah, we can talk later. <laughs> uh, until next time, though, thanks for tuning in. And I do recommend this for anybody who is Lutheran and wants to understand uh, at a very solid level uh, the uh, religious bodies in America from the holy, holiness movements and John Wesley's involvement in that to some of the sects and the restorationists of the uh, 18th century Nazarenes and whatnot. And, of course, the section on Romanism is very good. And there's a whole section on Lutheranism that is, is quite solid. I've been wanting for years to reread this. I haven't gotten around to it yet. And part of me wants to rewrite it again. I just... I I just don't know that I'm the guy with the scholastic wherewithal, but you out there, you seminarian, think about it. Yeah, yeah. Do it again, and let's get a uh, the Warrenites and the Hybelites in here somewhere, and I guess we should call them the Druckerites and their fascist ideology, but that's a different story for a different day. Thanks for tuning in to Worldview Everlasting. If you like what we do, you can subscribe. You can give five bucks a month and make all this possible and help us get going further, faster in the future. And uh, otherwise, rock on. <laughs>